Whoa, hey, whoa, hello. Okay, guess what guys? Montreal has height restrictions. You aren't allowed to build taller than 233 meters in Montreal. <laughs> There are two buildings downtown that are at the maximum height, 1250 René Levesque and 1000 De La Gauterie. Go La Gauterie. Not sure which one. <coughs> Difficult French of a day. 1250 is actually only the tallest with its little spire on top, which to me kind of feels like measuring the length of your penis from the anus. Since those buildings were topped off in the 90s, they've actually made the regulations uh, even stricter. Now, you both cannot build higher than 233 meters above sea level, but you also can't make your particular building higher than 200 meters. And there's also specific zones. So the actual amount of land that you can build a full tall building in is pretty limited. <laughs> Philadelphia, which is a city on the uh, east coast uh, full of unhappy and insecure people, has two buildings that were built in the same era. And those were the first to break this gentleman's agreement that Philadelphia had of not building a building taller than the hat of the statue on top of City Hall. The City Hall in Philadelphia is incredibly impressive. The statue on top is William Penn. <laughs> it's a thin William Penn. William Penn is kind of like Elvis. There's a fat um, William Penn and a thin William Penn from his earlier days. So the first of the buildings, one Liberty Place, broke that informal understanding. And since then, the Philadelphia skyline has been a no holds bar build uh, skyscraper area. So if Philadelphia had William Penn's hat, what do we have in Montreal? Well, we have Montreal. And I think mixed into the reason why we are using Montreal is the traditional Catholic thing. There's been a cross up there since 1643, which was put up there after um, a really big flood. Prayers were made and a promise to God, or probably because they're a Catholic uh, secondary deity. The story kind of sounds like one of those, uh, you know, moments that I think a lot of people will have where something goes horribly wrong and even if you're religious, you'll be like, oh, okay, okay, just give me this one and give me this one and I'll do it, you know? And then like the next day you forget. Well, because back in 1643, they actually were very superstitious. They followed through and they put the cross up there and the version of the cross has been there ever since. It's safe to say that mixed into all the reasoning is this kind of just tradition. Just like William Penn's statue, we as human beings are prone to doing a kind of incredible mental gymnastics to stick with something that we've just always done and uh, don't particularly want to change. So for whatever reason, I calculated the heights of various cities in Canada and the United States that are famous for their skyscrapers, and you can see that there's a kind of strange distribution of Montreal's tallest buildings, where other cities tend to have a big tick at the end of super tall buildings. We're hitting that same point and plateauing. I think it's probably time to ask why we have the height restriction and if we should continue. Obviously, the property developers in town are at the point where if it wasn't there, they would be pushing through and have built a few taller buildings, just like Philadelphia have. Now that they're not too worried about offending Skinny William. And we're also in this kind of new renaissance of super tall skyscrapers. A lot of new materials and new methods have come along, which has meant the brief pause in skyscraper construction has given way to a large amount of skyscrapers being built. And Montreal is experiencing this just like other cities, except unlike other cities, we're kind of bumping up against this number. So is this policy stupid? Yes, it is. Now that Jesus is out of the way, the primary justification for the policy is that it blocks views of and from Montreal. However, it still blocks views. Pretend you have a person standing on Montreal and you have another person standing far away. Here is a building that is at the same height above sea level as Montreal. You can actually see this in action if you go to Victoria Bridge and look back towards the city center. Obviously, if all the buildings along the skyline were built to 233 meters, you would not be able to see the mountain anymore. It's also stupid because if you're the sort of person who likes to see greenery and a nice park in your city, then you're probably not the sort of person who wants to do harm to the environment but not letting people live more densely is terrible for the environment. Edward Glazer, who's a very famous urbanist economist. We've measured carbon emissions in different parts of the country. And what you see should not surprise any of you. The places that look green 
are brown, the places that look brown are green. And I discovered this personally when I started acquiring small children about 12 years ago. That's how economists talk. He uh, wrote a book that I actually have a copy of, Triumph of a City. Yeah, there's a chapter in it called, Is There Anything Greener Than Blacktop? You can plant as many trees as you want and, and recycle as much water as you want. You have to work incredibly hard to just achieve the same level as a person living in a condo downtown. As soon as you have to say, drive a pickup truck into town because you're living on some organic farm. You blew it! And luckily, we don't have to, as a government, convince people to live and work downtown. We don't have to say, oh, you should recycle and you should live downtown. People right now actually really, really want to. It's literally what millennials would like to do. So in limiting the height of these buildings, you're just limiting the number of residential units that there are downtown. Where will those people live if they can't live downtown? Well, they're going to live somewhere else. The people that can't live downtown in Montreal will live on the plateau, and then the people that can't live on the plateau are going to live in the suburbs, and the people that can't live in the suburbs right now are going to live in new greenfield developments even further out. So the more that you can put in downtown, the better for everyone. It's also a stupid policy because it makes housing expensive. So there's the obvious, you know, if there's um, a thousand less units in downtown than there would otherwise be. The reason why it's too expensive to live in these cities is we haven't built enough. New York used to build 100,000 units a year in the 1920s, and the city stayed affordable despite huge demand for urban space. What you see is the places that build a lot, like Houston or Austin or Dallas or Atlanta aren't expensive, and the places that are expensive don't build a lot, right? There's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. So that whole, I'm a millennial and I want to live downtown, oh, I can't because there's not enough room for me, bidding war, all that stuff, generally with restrictions on stuff, almost any restriction or rule that you put in on property development will lead to more expensive property. Say an imaginary developer has a piece of land and they know that people want some condos. So they figure out, say, that they can put 20 units on this piece of land, they can build it for $200,000 each unit and then sell all those units for $300,000. But if the city comes along and says you have to have 25% of a lot as green space, the property developer changes the plan and now it's 15 units, which means there's a lower supply, so there's less units like this around and more people outbidding each other at auctions. And because many of the costs to build this thing are fixed, each unit is now gonna cost something like $220,000 to build. You know, you still needed to get the crane out there, you still needed to submit the plans, you still needed to get the lot leveled, you still needed to demolish the old building that was on it. Now if the city comes in and says, oh, it needs to be LEED certified, or if it needs to be disabled parking, or you need to put in affordable housing units. All of these things are going to make the units that go on the market more expensive. We need to recognize that we don't get any of this stuff for free. And we need to decide as a community, are we all prepared to pay $100 more in rent a month or $60,000 more for your mortgage to have houses built a certain way with a certain number of trees around them to a certain standard out of a certain material. No one in the city from the richest, wealthiest person here to the person who is one notch above living on the street isn't affected by these policies. And height restrictions is one of these things. Now you know what I say almost when I say almost every restriction or rule. There are a few things related to sprawl which if you totally deregulate them and let people do whatever they want will actually burden the city with something long term. The sprawl becomes a problem because when you build the city further out you suddenly need to build new infrastructure and if people work downtown you start to over time need to widen highways and build new bridges and tunnels that you hadn't planned on building before just for these people that are trying to get between the two places. And if you compare that to like an empty car park near a metro station downtown, when a building is built there, that's a massive amount of tax income for the city for basically no additional cost. Any footpath that they build and maintain downtown gets tons and tons of usage and value for money compared to a footpath they have to build for a new development on the edge of a city. So what fucking sucks in Montreal is we are making it really, really easy to sprawl, but hard to densify. We're doing the opposite of what we should be doing. So the problem is Off Island is not the city of Montreal. So we're doing things like building the REM with park and ride car parks, 
and we're talking about building like South Shore transit lines and we're having to foot the bill for all this new infrastructure largely because we're not making better use of the land that we already have the infrastructure around. So what do we do from here? Well, normally there's a bit of an evolution with these laws, and you can see this in Montreal itself. Montreal used to have a 10-story height restriction, and that was increased to 33 stories, and I will bet my life that at some point in future, the 233 will become 300, and it's just ridiculous. Get it over with and let people build tall buildings. These laws, they start off as kind of simple, here's the maximum height, and then turn into kind of more sophisticated things that better achieve the specific goals. So instead of, say, capping the height, you set up viewing corridors where you say, well, a lot of people spend time in Parc La Fontaine, so we want to maintain a viewing corridor between these two because that's nice for the city. But in other areas, just go nuts. You can also have a system where you trade air rights between buildings, which is what New York has now, or you can have a setback requirement, which lets more light into the roadways, which is what New York traditionally had. But overall, I think it's better to focus on high quality standards more than it is to focus on the unnuanced number of height. If you look at the Sun Life building, for example, it was actually the tallest building in the British Empire for many, many years. But it's such a beautiful building that I don't really mind it, you know? There's also one building in town that's taller than the mountain at 263 meters above sea level, which is St. Joseph. And again, seeing that beautiful building perched on the hillside doesn't make me feel at all annoyed. Vancouver even has a policy where they make developers buy public art when they build a tall building. So, you know, well, we blocked your view, but then you got this, you know. So you can have like all sorts of different ways to deal with and handle uh, the potential downsides of, of having a view blocked. In the end, Montreal is predicted to add about a million residents or so to the greater area. And despite all of the success of the city centre in recent years, Montreal is still growing faster out than it is up. I think through looking at this one particular city regulation, it's a good way to look at a lot of city regulations and a lot of what we're trying to do here and ask the question, is this actually going to result in cheaper housing? Is this actually going to create a city that has a lower environmental footprint? Both of those things conveniently go hand in hand. So whether you're a conservative person who doesn't like the city or a bleeding heart liberal who believes in We actually are kind of on the same side with this one. And with new developments coming up, like the Blue Bonnets Raceway and um, all the development in Griffintown, I think it's really helpful to decide when we want to regulate and if the regulations that we're talking about are actually going to achieve that goal. Because as a person who loves Montreal, I would hate to see Montreal turn into a city like San Francisco or Vancouver or Paris, where restrictions have made it so hard to build housing that people who've lived there their whole fucking life have to leave, that sucks. And the number one thing that's gonna improve that situation is increased supply in the places that people wanna live, which is downtown. I like you, cause you have such lovely ways. Hey, hey, I like you, cause you're so sweet, so neat, so cute, and everything, baby, I like.